It's fantastic to have all of you on stage, and uh, I think we have a real sort of uh, interdisciplinary tour, tour de force uh, with a philosopher, a political scientist, and a physicist. Um, so maybe um, just to give us a bit of context, Asa, maybe you'd like to just talk us through uh, what the ideas <coughs> here are, and uh, just a bit of context. Yeah, so, I mean, people have touched on one solution, which is through legislation, right? Yeah. Policy making, um, and which is to say through democracy. <laughs> uh, but, of course, when it comes to legislation as a solution to this problem of disinformation, it is a tricky issue because uh, it cuts to the core of democracy, to free speech and exchange of ideas. Um, and there's a rightful suspicion of any kind of government intervention in how we talk to each other. So that, that's a challenge. Uh, and yet we do need some kind of legislation, and it, but it needs to be wise and it needs to be well anchored in, 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 uh, among the people. Um, so there's this interesting research field that's been growing the last few decades called basically innovations in democracy. And that's the idea that we need to innovate democracy for 21st century. We need to find new ways to get people to participate more, um, not just by voting, but also by engaging in the public reasoning that's very much essential to democracy. Uh, and the idea go back, goes back to this sort of idea that the great American philosopher John Dewey had that democracy is a way of life. And very much part of that way of life is not just going voting every three, four years, but participating in public debate, in public reasoning, and that's deliberation. So there's this uh, all sorts of uh, attempts to, do, to increase the public deliberation through various kinds of citizen assemblies. Um, there was a famous case in, in British Columbia where they had a citizen assembly uh, deliberating on how to uh, uh, change the electoral laws, uh, on participatory budgeting they've done in Brazil, they've done it in Scotland, on local level, uh, even the climate change uh, citizen assemblies in the UK and in France where it's interesting because it shows you can, you can counteract science denial through proper deliberation. And proper deliberation involves, at least uh, it involves, well, a random selection of people, so you have a good uh, uh, combination of people, but also um, expert input. Because just deliberating without knowledge is just, you know, opining. <laughs> you need expert input to, to come to, to a good uh, decision. And you need moderators so that the deliberation is an exchange of reasons and not of insults, <laughs> basically. That's the idea. Um, and uh, the output, of course, these people are not elected representatives. The output is not decisions, but it's input to policy making. And that, uh, uh, and that has been shown to work really well. So the interesting question now is, can we use this knowledge we have from innovations in democracy and, and use those kinds of uh, practices to apply to this problem that we are facing. And that's, that's what this deliberative polling today is, is, was about. That's a fantastic piece of context for us. And I think, uh, you know, uh, packaging it into the time that we have is, is a challenge. But I think we'll, uh, we'll get uh, James now to please give us um, an overview of the work that you've done that, that has led to this. Yes, so we've been doing what I call deliberative polling which is a particular model of taking random samples of the public, good samples, uh, uh, reasonably sized samples, who uh, deliberate in depth. So a deliberative poll is a poll of a population before and after. What we did with, in cooperation with the Nobel Prize Summit is not a deliberative poll because it doesn't have a stratified random sample but it's a pilot of the process, a demonstration of the process, and the best way to learn about something is l learning by doing rather than just watching. So uh, people around the world had the experience of participating in deliberative polling uh, in the process. Now, when we do a deliberative poll, it, the good conditions, we, we engage people in good conditions. What are the good conditions? It's very simple. We have uh, balanced briefing materials that have been vetted with good information, where the contested arguments on either side are identified as contested, the uh, facts that we can establish are identified as established, 
Uh, and the deliberation is about value-laden goals, the competing pros and cons of specific policy proposals, things that could be done. And so we've done 120 of these projects around the world in 50 countries, and often they have been inputs to decision. Uh, it brought Texas from being last to being first in the amount of wind power in the United States over a period of years and a bunch of projects. Just this past weekend, South Korea commissioned a national deliberative poll. The National Assembly commissioned a national deliberative poll on national television, and I was privileged to uh, appear on the broadcast, but it was about how to reform their electoral system. They were deadlocked in terms of different views. The two major parties agreed on an agenda that was brought to the people, and the results were very dramatic, and the, the speaker announced on national television that he thinks they will have a, uh, guided by that, they will come up with a new law for changing the electoral system. That's the most recent example just this past weekend. Uh, but uh, it's been used in uh, many countries. Um, the idea, but now we've also developed a technology for this. That was face-to-face. -face. The country brought face-to-face -to -face together a good national sample. But we also do um, it, this online. First we did it online on Zoom, but now we do it online with a platform that was developed at Stanford with my computer science, uh, uh, my management science and engineering and computer science colleagues. And the platform was demonstrated here today. We also used it previously in the US with 1,000 deliberators on climate change with very dramatic results, uh, a very thoughtful and very dramatic results in changes of opinion. But the platform moderates the discussion without a human moderator. Uh, so there's a little bit of AI, but uh, it's, I, we don't call it AI. We say it's AI-assisted. But it controls the cue for talking. Uh, uh, it nudges the people who haven't talked. It intervenes when there's uncivil conversation. And indeed, we had one, uh, one occasion of incivility in these discussions uh, that, uh, in the demonstration. But usually, people uh, talk to each other in a civil manner. And the magic of deliberation, deliberation we've shown in uh, controlled experiments, reduces extreme partisan polarization and opens up people to listening to the other side. And it, in that manner, it corrects misinformation and disinformation. And it cools the temperature in the conversation so that people actually um, can come to informed conclusions. And we get the informed conclusions in confidential questionnaires. We have all the criticisms of deliberation come out of the jury literature. Uh, because in, juries do a pretty good job for questions of fact, but there's social pressure for consensus and to reach a verdict. Uh, in our method, we don't have that because we get the conclusions in confidential questionnaires. People never have to say how they really come out. They consider the competing sides of the argument, and they come up with questions for panels of competing experts, which is what we demonstrated in these uh, deliberations around the world here for the Nobel Prize Summit, too. And people, people don't just defer to the, uh, to the experts. They have experts who may disagree, and they listen to the competing arguments and we don't turn the people into experts. We don't replace the experts with the people. Rather, the experts need to listen to the way the people consider competing value-laden goals of public policy. And those competing value-laden goals have to come from the people. We don't want to just, democracy is not about implementing the, goal, the values of the experts. It's about the people being informed enough to uh, think about um, what really should be done. So we have aspirations for, spa for scaling this kind of deliberation as well. And we viewed this uh, uh, opportunity, which we were given and we're very happy about, as a, as a pilot uh, to demonstrate the possibility for scaling. Because with this platform, we could do any number of people. Imagine if you had a deliberative society rather than the kind of society we have now. That's a really, really good bridge to um passing it on to Seoul, because we would really like to find out what happened today. Maybe you could, uh, what you could so, tell us. So uh, two things. First, I'll say a, a word or two about why we were doing it particularly here. Um, I think, first of all, we, 
earlier on, we were doing a lot of discussion about you know, how to tell the science story better to the public. But I think that we, this is one of the first chances we had uh, today to be practicing the question of what does it look like um, to do a two-way conversation. So that um, we feel it, because I think trust building really does involve, um, at least today, I think it really should involve um, a lot of this two-way conversation. So the values and the goals and the fears are coming from the public, and then, but they're constrained by the, by the expertise um, that's available from the experts. So that was, I think, a good reason for this to be done at all, but then, it, it, today in, in, in this context. The other thing, though, that's particular about our problem that we're discussing, the misinformation, is that almost all of the proposals, probably every proposal, um, for how to deal with it has this risk involved that you don't want a, um, a, a government or an industry um, to potentially be putting their thumb on the scales of, of what counts as misinformation or, or, or what it is that you're trying to you know, suppress and what it is you're trying to, uh, to you know, en enliven. Um, and so you need to find some mechanisms to be able to give some oversight. And so the thought was that this would be an interesting proposal as a, as a route to uh, seeing what would it look like if we used deliberative participatory democracy ap approaches to providing some oversight for policy. Um, concepts. So that was why this was a, uh, we were trying this out today. And the topics, uh, I, I don't know if everybody had a chance to see, but I just uh, brought along. The, the kinds of topics that were being de deliberated on included things about whether um, we should be regulating the algorithms that are being used by the, by the uh, online platforms, whether the platforms should provide easy access to the data for academics and researchers, um, questions about digital literacy, whether there should be a possibility of, of pre-bunking PSAs. Um, fact checking, whether the fact checking should be overseen by perhaps a deliberative process, and also um, authenticity, questions of whether there should be perhaps unique anonymous identifiers for any post, or um, whether AI generated material should be registered in some way so you can find it later that this came from a, a, a known AI. Okay. And, uh, and so I can report that just coming in off the wire because the, uh, the most recent, there, there were four deliberations this past weekend that were three hours each. Um, and then there was a full deliberation today that was four hours uh, that involved going back and forth between deliberation and the, the experts. And so um, it's just finished a, a few minutes back and I was just getting back some of the uh, responses. Apparently um, some of the quotes were interesting from the in small group discussions uh, from Japan. There was a comment about somebody they used to strongly agree about providing data to the researchers. Um, uh, but they realized after the discussion that there was some concern about um, being able to identify who the real researchers are and that that um, struck them as something that had to be folded into the, into the discussion. There was apparently something from Namibia where there was a concern that the fact checking um, had to be done in some way that was sensitive to the fact that there were different cultures and that you might end up having some cultures suppressing other cultures if you're not careful um, in, how you, in how you do that. Point. From the United States, apparently there was uh, a comment about the uh, public service announcements being a good idea, um, but they were afraid that, the, that they might be coming in too late um, in a process um, where people have already uh, come in with their own desires and, and anger or communication goals. Um, so those were some of the uh, comments apparently in the small groups. Um, I gather that the kinds of questions that went to the, uh, to the experts included questions about um, whether AI, if you have AI uh, generating um, uh, material that's been labeled, they want to know how, so far, um, how has AI been useful for reducing misinformation to the experts? Mm -hmm. um, and they were asking the experts, um, let's see what else here. Oh, there's a question about uh, what specific strategies would be recommended? This is from Canada. Um, how would you recommend to reduce negative perceptions about regulation? Um, since in order to tackle the issues we are discussing, um, it looked like in their discussions that regulation um, will inevitably be essential. So, so those were some of the comments. And then I'll just comment that in the polls and the surveys that were done from these groups, small group discussions apparently were considered to be 96% 96, 96 of people thought they were valuable. The briefing materials that were given uh, with pros and cons, 86% um, called those valuable. Uh, the plenary sessions with the experts were 68%, and the event as a whole was seen as 90%. Uh, uh, actually, 90.92. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah. so th that's a, a fast result, but we don't yet have the analysis of how do people change their minds, which I think is sort of one of the more exciting aspects of this to see you know, what, 
what do people learn when they do this kind, kind of event? Yeah. And so we'll maybe uh, be able to pass that word later. No, abs absolutely. Yes, Asa. No, I just, on the, on the note of hope, right? I mean, there's been a lot about how irrational we are. And we are, on occasion, very irrational human beings. But basically, we are the rational animal, right? Yeah. We're capable of thinking rationally, and we want to think rationally. But we need the conditions for that to happen. And included in those conditions are a, a, a decent information environment, knowledge input, and a decent emotional environment. Absolutely. Then our rationality will kick in, because we are basically rational. I think one has to hold on to that idea when one discusses solutions to all of this and not just think that it's about trying to manipulate people to get the truth. We need to try to engage people's basic rationality to get the truth. Absolutely. So I think that's uh, some really important points. We have a red light flashing here telling us to uh, wrap it up. Uh, but maybe, uh, James, if you have one oh, last... Oh, I, I would just add, um, if you think about spreading this, the, what Saul, the evaluation Saul mentioned on the platform, are, not, are stunning, and we have other data to that effect. So people like it so much, we think we could spread it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't allow people to recommend to their friends if we were good, using a scientific sample. They were very careful about a stratified random sample. But for scaling the deliberations, those results are the, the hope. Uh, and um, we even find effects from the, using the online platform a year later in terms of how people voted. At least those are uh, two cases, one for the uh, US general election, last presidential election, and more recently for the midterm, effects a year later. So it makes a real impression on people when they deliberate in depth, moderated discussion with diverse others, getting their questions answered, learning to listen to others, uh, has, can have a long-term effect on people. So. Yeah. Truth, trust, and hope all together. <laughs> Absolutely, and there's a real impact here. I think when we were preparing for this panel, we were going to talk about how we could potentially use this in decision making in the European Union, over here in the US, and so on. I think we can keep that going, hopefully, with all of you after we wrap this up. But uh, I'm going to really thank you very, very much for this session, and uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much.